Good morning. I like having that little video to let me uh, set up over here. <laughs> you guys can watch something pretty and fun. Um, welcome to service today. My name is David Lawson. I'm one of the ministers here alongside my wife, Teresa. And uh, I need to start scheduling the sermon before the communions. <laughs> Last week, Teresa, my wife, did an amazing job. This week, Marilyn, I, I feel like, what am I going to add to today? So next week, maybe I'll do it before the communion next week. They did a great job. Um, just, that's right. Just the, the, the worship team and Tiffany welcoming us, Marilyn and Tay, uh, just an amazing young couple here in our church. We're so grateful to have people in our church like them uh, who, who really are giving us hope for the future uh, of God's kingdom. So thank you guys so much for, for leading our worship today and getting us, our hearts ready. Thank you. So uh, I spent, you know, many of you know I'm from Philadelphia, and I spent a good portion of my time between my parents' homes. One was in Taconi, which is where I primarily live. My, my dad lived in a town called Fishtown. Now, this means nothing to anyone who's not from Philadelphia, but just think of a ghetto, and that's Fishtown. I mean, it was a rough place to be. You didn't want to be hanging out with the wrong people because you were going to get beat up or jumped or whatever. Uh, no one had a pool, right? No, like, if, if, at best, maybe someone had, like, a little wading pool and their concrete slab in their backyard. That's about it. Uh, and so when summer came, what we used to like to do was open up the fire hydrant. Anyone else remember that? <laughs> right? You guys know what I'm talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about, at least. It's really hard to do nowadays. They, they shut that stuff down. It, it's like, it, it seems like it's rarer and rarer. And I understand it's bad for the city, and I, I know, I know. But when you're, when you're you know, you're, it's 100 degrees out, and the humidity is 100%, and you're dying in the summer, a good fire hydrant felt real good. And uh, if anyone has ever experienced that, it's, it's awesome. But you know that you do not want to go head on to the fire hydrant because the water coming out there is coming so fast, it will, it will blow you over. It will knock you down. So why am I sharing this? Well, today is going to be a little bit like a fire hydrant, guys. <laughs> All right? So I just want to prepare you for what we're going to do today. Um, you know, we're continuing on in setting the keystone, the foundational studies for the Gospel of Luke. Uh, last week, we talked about the place that we were in, right? We, we kind of examined the land of Judea and Galilee, and we realized that the space that Jesus' ministry took place in was not much different in terms of space and geography as our, as our uh, San Fernando Valley here is, this little square that we call home. Uh, the size of our church is very similar to the village that he grew up in, right? So, so we drew these parallels to that time, to that place, and while the culture was different, there were some similarities that we can connect with. Well, today what we're going to look at are, are the people that fill the space. We're going to look at the different groups of the Jews who were around that time, who Jesus was interacting with. Uh, if, you, if you're a follower or a fan of the Bema Discipleship Podcast, some of this might even sound familiar to you because a lot of it was inspired from just me, me listening to that. Uh, so I'm drawing from some, some great thinkers uh, of our time as well. But why are we studying the Gospel of Luke? Why are we looking into this one in particular? Well, our vision here at the Valley Church is to be with Jesus, right? And by being with him, we want to become like him. And then ultimately, we want to be able to do the things that we saw him doing. And we chose Luke because of this passage right here, right at the beginning. Luke says this in chapter 1, verse 4. He says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, for, who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may, be, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Luke's gospel was designed to give us an orderly account. He interviewed eyewitnesses, the other disciples, the apostles. He talked probably to Mary, the mother of Jesus, to get some of those stories from the youth, and the Magnifica that, that you know, is later on in chapter one. He, he was living in, in, in the time that these events were happening. He was seeing the miracles that took place. He also wrote the, the, the book of Acts. And so he's recording personal firsthand experiences and he's collecting all this data and compiling it in a way that is orderly that we can trust because of the witnesses, because of the testimonies that were taken, right? This is very comfortable for us in our, in our Western culture. Like we want things researched, we want things laid out well and, 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 and for it to make sense. And that's what Luke was trying to do. He was writing to a Gentile audience, people who were not primarily Jews. 
And so his gospel is, is given to us so that we may have certainty in the things that we read, right? You don't have to check your intelligence at the door, right? We've got a, we've got a, do, a couple doctors in here, a couple masters, right? We, we have very smart people here. To have faith in Jesus does not require just some kind of ignorance. You can be an intelligent, reasonable, uh, logical person and still have an incredibly strong faith in Christ. And we want you to be assured of that. And so that's why we chose the Gospel of Luke. And so as I mentioned last week, we looked at the place and the powers this week, we're gonna look at the people who fill the land, and then next week, we'll, we'll close up the keystone, and we're gonna look at the purpose of the gospel, who Luke was trying to speak to, who were his, his target audiences, who were the people that he was really trying to help connect to the mission and the life of Jesus Christ. Before we jump in, I wanna pray. So please bow with me as we go, go to in prayer. Father, we thank you for today, for the chance to sing songs of praise, to take communion, to give of our wealth, uh, to be here in fellowship with one another. God, we would ask that you be with us today, that you open up our hearts and our minds. God, help us to, to hear your scriptures, to, to put ourselves into the place that Jesus was in, God, so that we can learn more about him, so that we can become more like him, and ultimately that we can do the things that we see him doing. Father, we thank you for this time, and it's in your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we're going to start off in Jeremiah 23, in verse 3. Now, at this time, Jeremiah is writing that the, the Jews are going into exile, into Babylon, and the city is being destroyed and ravaged, and people are being carried out in chains uh, to be made slaves or to be sent to foreign lands that they have no familiarity with. And there's a lot of fear because for the Jewish people, that was their promised land. That was the promise that was given to them through Abraham and that they carried it on all the way until this time. And now it was being taken from them. And so there was questions, there was doubt, there was, there was fear. Well, what if we're not God's people anymore? What if the promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not valid anymore? What if, what, what if God has forgotten us? And Jeremiah sends this, shares this passage with them to give them encouragement. He says, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous savior. The people were sent into exile, but they were given a promise of hope that God would send to them shepherds to, to tend to their flocks, that he would send to them a, a chosen branch, a righteous branch who would become king over them and it would reign over them and restore their lands. This is, uh, next slide please, sorry. Um, there we go. That is the biblical world. So last week I didn't have any maps because we were, I was trying to conceptualize this, the space here. This is a big scope, so I kind of want to give you the, the, the vast array. You can see uh, Israel's right over here somewhere, and then that's the rest of the, the Roman world, the Greek world at the time. And so I'm going to kind of go through some stuff fast here, guys, so take notes. But if you miss something, that's okay. We record all of our sermons. You can catch them on YouTube. If you're not subscribed yet, go ahead, like, and subscribe. <laughs> all right. So the Jews were carried out into Babylon, and they lived there in exile. Uh, they, they spent a time there, and they, they multiplied. They grew. They flourished. They flourished the lands that they were a part of, and they spread out throughout the, the, the Asia Minor and, and, and the Greek world during this time. Ultimately, Persia takes over the region and builds an empire larger than any before, uh, and the Jews are allowed to begin to go back into their homeland, to begin to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the city of Jerusalem itself, but they're still a vassal to the Persian empire. And then someone we probably all know, Alexander the Great, comes through and, and just sweeps through the Persian empire, claiming it all for Greece. And this is a huge point in, in just history let alone the Bible, right? The concepts of Hellenism are spread around the known world at this time. And if you don't know what Hellenism is, just think of Greek stuff, right? Greek mythology, Greek art, Greek culture, all of these ideas, these, these concepts, the language, the culture, the festivals, the gods themselves, they were spread throughout 
Alexander's empire. And what you need to know about Hellenism more than anything else, because this is what changes the course of, of Western culture for the next thousands, thousands of years. The driving principle of Hellenism was the man is the measure of all things. So before this, the gods were the measure. So we sacrifice to the gods to keep them appeased so they don't send the floods and the hurricanes and the rains and the famines and the, the plagues. But now the, the, the Greek culture had shifted the lens to ourselves. And we were now the definition by which we were going to interpret the world around us. That's why so much Greek art is about the physical body, right? Like you see the Greek statues and they're, they're gorgeous. They're unbelievable because the goal was to perfect the image of man. And so this is the concept and the idea that is just spread throughout the region of Israel, throughout the region of Asia Minor, Greece, uh, and later on Rome comes in and they take over and all they do is just make those ideas more concrete, bigger, better. They take them, they change some of the names of the gods, but the same gods, same story, and they just add on to them and solidify these concepts. And so the world that Jesus is living in, the world that the disciples are living in is a world that is defined by man, by how we interact with it. And all we need to do is look at our culture today and we can see that that is still true in our postmodern world. In fact, it's gotten hyper-focused now and the lens by which we look at the world is the self. What is important to me? What is my idea of what is right and wrong? What is good and evil? What is my idea of gender or sexuality? Uh, what is my idea of justice and what justice is? It's not interpreted by the culture anymore or by the community that we're a part of. It's interpreted by the individual. Don't mess with me, I won't mess with you. Right, you're fine, we're, we're gonna be okay as long as your ideas don't come up against my ideas of what's right and wrong and then we've got a problem. Right, so we are living very much in a Hellenistic culture to this day, it's, just, it's, it's gotten hyper-focused since that time. And this is the world that Jesus and the disciples live in. This is the world that we're gonna take a part of. And so when the people returned to the land, they were determined to never be sent into exile again. They were determined to never allow what had happened 400 years ago when the Babylonians came in, when the Assyrians came in in the Northern Kingdom and take away God's promised kingdom. And so they, they, they started to, to form factions or groups or, or ideologies of thought to, to prevent that from happening. To, to set the circumstances that were ripe for the Messiah, that promised branch, the king, to come in and reign forever in Jerusalem. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at five distinct groups. These were not the only groups that were around at the time, but these are, these are five that were probably the most prevalent, that probably the most relevant to what we're, what we're gonna be studying over the next uh, for the foreseeable future. And I don't know if like you, or like me, you guys, would think of the Jews as kind of this one group of people, right? One ideology, one belief system, one structure, one way of doing things. I used to think that way. I think we do that a lot in our culture today, right? We, we wanna, we wanna, the other group, we wanna kind of contextualize them in a way that makes sense to us. And so we lump everyone into a box, right? Into, into one, one vision of the thing, a stereotype, as it were, right? But we know intellectually that's not true. If you look in this room here, the diversity of thought and opinion would span the spectrum, right? Because we all have different backgrounds, different cultures, different experiences, we're different ages, we're different races, we're different genders. And so all of those things contribute to our experience and it would have been just the same for the Jewish people at the time. And so we have to remember that. But the first group we're gonna look at is a group that you're probably familiar with and this is, these are the Sadducees. And so here's some bullet points in them. They, they were a line of priestly families that went back to the times of King David. They're the family of Zadok, the, pre, the high priest, right? They were, they were the Zadokim or the Zadokites, uh, and then it gets later on translated to the Sadducees. This group didn't particularly believe in the bodily resurrection, right? So there was a lot of debate, a lot of times when we see them in scripture, they're actually asking Jesus about the resurrection because they're trying to capture him, they're trying to trick him uh, into saying something that would, that would slip him up, but of course they couldn't do that. You see that in Luke 20, verse 27. This group actually, sorry, This group here lobbied to have Herod become king over them. Uh, they, 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 one of the daughters from one of their prominent families was, was married off to Herod, 
uh, because they saw the writing on the wall. They saw Herod was close with Rome, and, and there was a way to establish a, a connection to the power, to, the, to, the, to the, the guy who was coming in, who was rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, who was rebuilding, revitalizing that community, and they wanted to be at the reins of power. And so they bring in Herod, and there were seven primary families in, in, in the Sadducees, that, and these were, these were the people that were known as the chief priests. When you see that phrase in the scripture, that's what it's referring to. And you can picture this group very much as you would picture the mafia. They were a group of families who were connected, who, who, who held on to power by whatever means necessary. In fact, because Herod got appointed king, like any crooked politician, he, he honors his promises, and he, he selects the high priest uh, to, to reign over, over the land. And so it's a very corrupt group of individuals, but they hold the power, and they do have a God-given or ordination to be the priest of the people, however they've corrupted it. They're consumed by power, by wealth, uh, and by their own security. Uh, the temple guard that we read about in the scripture, they would have been run by the Sadducees. And so you can kind of picture these guys as the enforcers, the guys going around collecting the, uh, the, 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 what was it, the security money, right, <laughs> from the surrounding areas. Uh, the temple itself, right, when we read about the temple and Jesus going in there and, and flipping the tables, Right. Well, the reason there was money lending going on was because the Sadducees let it go on and they let it be corrupt and they let it, you know, they took a piece off the top. This was, this was a group of people who were very corrupt, but they held a lot of power and they were the priest of the community. Matthew 3, John the Baptist says this about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He says, but when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? The Sadducees were corrupt. They were concerned about their power. They were concerned about holding on to authority by whatever means necessary. It's this group, probably more than any other group that we encounter, that, that holds the, the bulk of responsibility for Jesus being crucified. Right? When, when he went to Jerusalem and started really going after them, that's when things got serious. Not that other people weren't trying to kill him, but, but this is the group that really pulled it off. And so we can see the downside of the Sadducees, right? They're corrupt, they're violent, they're consumed only for themselves. They'll compromise their own religiosity for the sake of power. They wear it like a cloak. The upside to this group, believe it or not, there is an upside. I know it's hard to find. <laughs> but they were given a role by God to minister to the people. Now, they were not fulfilling it, but had they, they could have had an influence in the people. And we see some Sadducees who were not corrupt, right? The father of John the Baptist, uh, Hezekiah, right, Hezekiah, did I say that right? I'm, so, I'm getting mixed up with my names, okay. He, he, was, he was a part of this family. And so he was someone who was not corrupt. He was someone who was still honoring God through his actions, through his ministry, and so there were some who were still powerful enough to resist the temptation, the corruption, maybe who weren't as connected. And so they were given a God-given ordination to minister to the people, and had they lived it out, the impact they could have had might have been great. Right, I'm sure none of us can relate to the desire for power, the desire to have more, the desire to have it at any cost, no matter who we hurt, who we step on, right? None of us can, can picture that, I imagine. None of us have seen that in the world that we work in, in our offices, in our politics, in our government, right? That doesn't make any sense to us today. There's no, there's no more Sadducees living right now. There's none in here, I hope. I don't know. The next group we're gonna look at are the Herodians. And this was not a political group. It wasn't even really a very organized group. It was more of a cultural movement, as it were. These were the people, as you could probably guess, who were, were kind of behind Herod and kind of behind the work that he was doing to revitalize Jerusalem. They were embracing the Greek Hellenistic culture that was coming in. These are the people, if you wanted to know what was going on, they knew, they knew the, the latest plays. They knew the, the, the hottest singers. They knew the best uh, chariot races to go and see, right? Like these are the people who were tied into the culture. If you wanted to know where the best party was, you would find a Herodian. You wouldn't ask like an Essene. We're gonna talk about those guys later, right? You would find someone who was dialed in. Many of them were, were most likely wealthy or very well off and they used their wealth to, to elevate themselves, right? They embraced the Hellenistic idea of man being 
the focal point of everything that, that we do. And so their homes would have been, uh, you know, uh, decorated and, and, and had mosaics that depicted the gods of Greece and, and the different heroes and the myths, things that you would never would have seen in a Jewish home before, right? Because the commandment to not have idols, right? Usually you'd see geometric patterns, if anything, but now they were fully embracing the culture, right? This was a group um, uh, that had given themselves over to idolatry, right? The self, man being the measure. That was, that was, their, that was their motto, but they were Jew. They, they were Jewish, right? And, and, and so there was, there was an idea, there was an understanding that perhaps we can hold on to both. Maybe I can be a Jew when I'm at synagogue and things are good and it's the, you know, it's the Passover feast, but when I'm outside, man, have you seen Gladius Maximus, the chariot racer, that guy? Whew, he's incredible, right? That's a real guy, I promise. I don't know, right? These were the people who were tied into the culture. And if we're being honest and we look around the world today and we look around probably in our own lives, this group probably most accurately reflects the world we live in today. How many of us need to be current on all the latest movies, television shows, right? We can, we can break down the, the, the new Red Album, Taylor's version or whatever, right? We, 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 we wanna be so in tune with what's going on in the culture that many times we'll compromise our integrity. We'll compromise our principles. We wanna, you know, euphoria, we wanna know what's going on with this show, euphoria that everyone's talking about, so we'll watch something that we probably have no business watching. Right, or, or, or we'll celebrate ourselves, we'll celebrate our achievements, we'll, we'll desire to consume more and more wealth, right? A couple months ago, we talked about living simply, right? There's this, this desire in us to acquire more. Right? Because somehow that projects to the world that we are more successful, that we are better, that we are smarter, that we've worked harder. Uh, if anyone follows current events, Kim Kardashian said a very crazy thing this week to the women saying, you know what, they just need to get off their lazy backsides and work harder because then they could be like her. As if that was the benchmark. As if that was the goal that we are striving for. This is something that I'm guilty of. I very much have shared this with you guys, like I, the temptation to have the, the newest thing, the latest trend, to be a part of the discussion. This is something that, that, that is resonates in my heart. Right? It's at my core, it's in our culture, it's infused our church, it's infused Christianity in America. We probably have a lot of Herodians living amongst us today. But there was a good side to the Herodians too. You might be thinking, well, what is that? If you listen to Bima, you know, so it's not gonna be a surprise for you. But the Herodians were perfectly situated to impact the culture. They were with the people. They had the trust of the people around them. They were, they were you know, liked by the people. Like I said, if you wanted to know what the hottest party was, you'd ask a Herodian. If they had just used that impact, if they had used that, that, that placement by God for him and for his kingdom, the impact that they could have had could have been significant. Right? Had they not compromised their integrity and chased after idols, whatever that was, wealth, religion, relationships, career, whatever. They could have had an amazing impact for God. So this was much of the Jewish world at this time, much of the, 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 the world in general. Here's a scripture from 1 John, verse, uh, chapter two, verse 15, warning us of a Herodian lifestyle. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. How are we doing so far? Are we doing okay? You guys still with me? All right. We're moving along. All right, here, here, here's a group called the Essenes. Now, this is a group that doesn't quite show up in scripture uh, in a way that would make sense to us. You know, you kind of have to look for them. They, they might be there. But the reason we know this group is primarily because of the documents we found, uh, you know, in the past hundred years of archaeology, the Dead Sea Scrolls and other documents that were found in caves in Jordan and the surrounding area. And their response to, to what had happened to the Jewish people, to what was going on in the world around them, the rise of Hellenism, was to withdraw. 
They said, forget this. This is corrupt. This cannot be redeemed. Let us go to the wilderness and live as God has intended us to live. That way, when he comes, he will see us. He will know that there is, there is a remnant of people who, are, who, have, who have been dedicated, who have kept themselves pure, who have not given in to the ways of the world. And so this group, they lived out in the deserts. They lived out in the, the mountains, in, in the caves. Uh, they, they were dedicated to, to living the scriptures out themselves, but they were also dedicated, thankfully, to copying the text. They took so much uh, care when they did this that, that the scribe would, would have, have the original text here, and then he would look at the letter, and then he'd write the letter, and there'd be someone who, who would supervise that and make sure that the letter looked good, and he would look and make sure it looked good. And then before doing anything else, he would go and watch his hands ritually to, to cleanse his hands again before he wrote the next letter. That was the care and dedication that these people had. And because of that, you know, with, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we were able to, to, to confirm the accuracy of the scriptures to like within 2% or something like that. It's, it's remarkable. How, how accurate our scriptures are because of work that these guys did, people like them, who, who, who cared about the scriptures with such fervor and passion. It would have been a little weird, right? You probably wouldn't have wanted to invite them to your party, right? They would have been the guy kind of, <laughs> hair's kind of askew, you know? A bit extreme, probably, right? You know, we all know people who, who live in the wilderness probably or have seen people who live in the wilderness. But they were people who were dedicated to, to living out righteously, in preparation for God. Uh, a scripture that was very important to them that was common amongst their writings was, was this one here in Isaiah chapter 40. In verse one, it says this, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been uh, completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is one of their, their, their you know, favorite scriptures. It's something they, they held on to. They wanted to be that people, right? They, they, they had lived the way they should. The sin had been paid for, and they were ready. Right, they were making straight the pass. This is a scripture that was, that was quoted very often by John the Baptist. And, and while John would have been related to the Sadducees by birth, there is some thought that perhaps he was raised by the Essenes, that he was sent out to the wilderness because he was a Nazarene, because of the lifestyle he was going to have to live. He was sent out there and perhaps taught by them. In fact, the ministry that he takes place in, in the Jordan River is not far from where many of these communities were found. And so we don't know for sure, but it's kind of fun to think about maybe that those two groups interacting. And of course, this is, this is one of his favorite scriptures. All right, the next group, we're almost done here, guys. We've got two more groups. The next group are the zealots, right? The zealots, we hear about them in scripture. The, this group was a political group. They had an agenda. They had something they wanted to accomplish. There were very large communities of zealots, some, some numbering like 9,000 people living in community together that believed it was their mission from God to overthrow Rome by any means necessary. There was a term used for them called the Sakari, which means dagger men, and it spoke to the curved blade that they carried. This was, this was a very early group of assassins. And, and what they would do is they would walk in a, in a very crowded space, and they would just pull out a dagger and stab a soldier and walk on before anyone noticed what happened, right? They, they believed that it was their mission from God to drive out the evil. That's how they were gonna bring about the Messiah and the new kingdom. They were gonna force the enemy out. Um, they, they were passionate. They were happy to fight for their beliefs. They were happy to die for their beliefs. Many times when they were cornered or captured and there was no hope of escape, they would, they would enter into ritual suicide. They would rather die by their own hands than at the hands of the Romans, right? If anyone knows the story of Masada, I won't go into that today. Look it up. That was a zealot community. One of the 12 disciples at least one of the 12 disciples was from this group. His name, fortunately enough, was Simon the Zealot, right? And so he, here was a guy who, who embraced violence as one of the 12 disciples, one of the apostles alongside Jesus. Jesus chose someone from this group to be a part of his party. And why is that? Well, let's look at it. In Numbers chapter 25, verse six, it says this. 
Then an Israelite man brought into a camp a Midianite woman, this would have been a bad thing to do, right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance to the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he left the assembly, took a spear in his hand, and followed the Israelite into the tent. He drove the spear into both of them, right through the Israelite man and into the woman's stomach. Then the plague against the, man, uh, against the Israelites was stopped, but those who had died in the plague were numbered 24,000. Goes on and says, The Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites, since he was zealous for my honor among them as I am. I did not put an end to them in my zeal. Right, Phineas, because of his passion for honoring God and his commandments and honoring the scriptures and living righteously, God relented on the plague that he, he put upon the people. He was willing to go out there and, and stand up for God, to stand up for the commands. And so while we don't endorse violence as the solution. We don't believe that that's what we should all start doing, carrying knives and just kind of stabbing people in the crowd. Please do not do that. Like, I, will, I just do not hold any responsibility for anything like that. What we can say about the zealots is they had a passion for God that could not be, un, or that could not be matched, right? The fact is, is we need some zealots in our church. Zealots are the people who are gonna get stuff done who are not gonna sit around and wait until everything's been committed to death and we've figured out the safest way to make sure that everyone feels good. They're gonna go out there and they're gonna get things done. You want someone to come to church? I'm gonna find someone to come to church. You wanna serve the poor? I'm in the kitchen this week serving food, right? You wanna build a shelter? Let's go out right now. Let's get some supplies, right? These are the people who will get stuff done. We need zealots in the church. But in that zeal, we cannot be harsh, we cannot be cruel, we cannot be unkind. And that's, that's the pitfall that we see in the zealots that were alive in the time of Jesus. The last group we're gonna look at, and this is the one that you're probably most familiar with here, are the Pharisees. This is the group that uh, they settled primarily in the region that we talked about last week, the region of Galilee. This is where most of them lived. And if you compare Galilee to the other regions like Jerusalem uh, in Judea, you would see a difference in the lifestyle. It was, it was, it was, it was very stark, right? There was not a lot of adornment in their homes. It was a very simple lifestyle. Because for the Pharisees, the focus was on being the people that God called them to be. They held, like the Essenes, they held the, the, the scripture, the text, to be of supreme importance. And their goal was to live in a way as, as strict adherence to the Torah so that, that God would look upon them and go, yes, my people are ready because they're living the way I've called them to live. Now, they also, in an effort to, to help achieve that goal, added on lots of other traditions to, to, to make these things even, even more difficult and more burdensome, right? They were the primary opposition to Jesus in his ministry. They would have been very legalistic, very, very by the book. If you didn't follow the traditions, if you didn't do it the right way, then you were offending God. And they weren't just trying to be jerks about it. Like they weren't just like, like going around because they felt like that, that's what they were called to do. For them, they believed that by living the right way, we could show God our repentance and that he would bring that righteous branch to us. And so the motives were good, right? They wanted to, to live in a way to honor God. It just gotten blown out of proportion and it had become burdensome, uh, had become something that Jesus challenges time and time again. We see this in Matthew 23, verse 23. It says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spice, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You see, the, the Pharisees were so stringent, they were so strict on how they practiced the wall that they, they never stepped out of line. Like you couldn't go to a Pharisee and say, you're not living the Torah. They were absolutely living the Torah and, and then some. So you could never hold them guilty for that. But they did not have concern for those who were on the margins, those who were sick or weak, those who were victimized, those who were abused, the, the, the stranger, the foreigner, 
because it was about living right. And if you weren't living the right way, you weren't doing anything to help the people of God, and so they were gonna come after you. This is why whenever Jesus, you know, picks some grains with his disciples on the Sabbath, they're, they're right there to challenge him, right? They don't see the need of the people. They see the breaking of God's commands. And what Jesus is telling them is, is what's more important is to, to, to remember mercy, kindness, faithfulness, while also honoring God's commands. If you lose your mercy and compassion, then, then, then you're missing the point, right? The Pharisees, out of all these groups, were probably the closest to being where they needed to be, and yet they probably were the furthest in some regards too, right? Jesus talks about the, the plank in your eye, right? You're worried about the speck in someone else's. This is probably who he was referring to. And so the question I want to leave you with today, as we talked about these groups, as we looked at the strengths and the weaknesses of these groups, as we think about the people that have filled the land 2,000 years ago, is who are you? Are you a Pharisee? Are you someone who is so focused on making sure that we act out everything that we see in Scripture exactly the way we see it, and you have no concern for your brother and sister who's hurting beside you? That you're so critical of someone else and their sin and what's going on in their lives that you can't even identify the sin in your own life. Or perhaps you're like the zealots and you're like, you know what, I'm sick and tired of this church not getting out there, not sharing their faith. Back in my day, it was different. We were on fire for God. We sold everything. We went anywhere, one suitcase. It didn't matter. But you forget the wreckage that was left behind. The people that you just abandoned because they were hurting and they were struggling and they just needed a little bit of, of help, but you couldn't be stopped. Maybe you're like the Essenes and you're like, you know what, spiritual disciplines and spiritual practices, reading the Bible, praying all day, that is the life for me. I just wanna do that all day, every day. And you're so withdrawn from the world that you live in that you have no connection to the people in your life, your family, your kids, your wife, your husband, your coworkers. You can't even be bothered to notice someone who's crying out to God because you're so consumed by just living your own spiritual life that you miss the people right in front of you. Maybe we're like the Sadducees, where all we are concerned about is ourselves, where all we are concerned about is our power, our influence, our status, our place in this society, and that we will do whatever it takes. We will compromise whatever we need to compromise, that we will lie, that we will steal, that we will cheat, that we will step on whoever we need to step on as long as I am still where I want to be. Missing the whole time the God-given role that we have in this world to minister to the people. But we're too blinded by our own selfish ambition. Maybe, and probably many of us, are like the Herodians. We're in the culture. We love the people. We, we want to be around the people all the time. We can't wait to be around the people and gossip and, and talk about the things that, you know, we shouldn't be watching, the things that we're filling our lives with the impurity, the idolatry. We're so consumed with, with wealth and status that, that, you know, the house that we have now is not big enough, right? The car that we drive is not good enough, right? We're, we're, we're keeping up with the Joneses, right? We're always a step behind them, so we got to keep going. we got to keep pushing on and on and on. We're so consumed and yeah, we're in touch, people like us, and, we're, and we have friends, and, and, and our Facebook friends are a thousand plus, but we're not living righteously. In fact, no one would even know that we're a Christian. Who are we in this story? You know, uh, if you've listened to the podcast, Marty Solomon, if you don't know Being the Discipleship, check it out, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, he concludes, and I, I don't know that I fully am on board, but I see what he's saying. He concludes that in the American church, most of us have the bad sides of the Herodians and the Pharisees. Culturally, we're so compromised that we couldn't have any influence in the world around us, but spiritually, we are so legalistic and so harsh that we hold everyone some standard that we're not living. Maybe he's right. I don't know but we need to think about who we are because as we're reading the gospel of Luke, we have to remember the goal here is to be with Jesus, to become and to be transformed 
into the image of Jesus. And then to take those things that we've learned, that we've become, and to do the things that Jesus did. That's what we are trying to achieve here in this church. That's what we wanna do. That's what we wanna be. When someone looks at our lives, they're not gonna see someone who's perfect. They're gonna see very broken people who still struggle with all the things we struggled with before we were Christians. But they're gonna see in our hearts a desire to do better, a desire to be better, a desire to be more like Christ. When we go out into the world, we wanna take the good things about these people. We wanna remember that we are a royal priesthood, that we are meant to be a part of this culture, even though we're not meant to take part in all the culture that we are meant to serve and minister to the people. We wanna, we wanna be a people of the text. We wanna honor God's word and celebrate it and proclaim it out loud, but not in a fashion that is harsh or cruel uh, or, or causes violence. We wanna be a people who, who, who celebrate the life of Christ and who not just celebrate it and hold some standard to it, but live it out in our day to day. This is why we're studying Luke. This is why we're gonna take as much time with Luke as we need because we don't wanna miss the things that these people missed. They knew the Bible, they knew the scriptures, they knew, they knew all this stuff, and yet they missed it. And ultimately, it led to Jesus being crucified on the cross because of it. Now, thank God he did, because of that, we have an entrance into salvation. And so we're grateful for that. But we don't wanna be accused to be like the Zealots or the Pharisees or, or the Sadducees. We wanna be disciples of Christ. We wanna be his sons and his daughters. We wanna be... Christians, like, like, like the word was intended, little Christs all throughout this valley. We, we want people to see us and go, there's something different about you. There's something different about this community that you're a part of. There's something different that you're trying to do here in the valley that no one else is trying to do. And that's what we're trying to achieve. That's what we're trying to do. And that's why we're, we're taking this time to set the stage so that when we come into this gospel, we are ready to learn and to draw from the wisdom that we see from Luke. So church, thank you guys so much for letting me share today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to welcome Jennifer up, and she's going to go ahead and just announce